I'm David Rasmussen with Colorado Cinema Spotlight. I'm here today with filmmaker Sean J.S. Jordan. Good to have you here, Sean. Good to be here. All right, we'll be seeing a couple clips from Sean's films, but first we'll have him tell us a little bit about himself. Sure, sure, sure. So um, I'm originally from, from New Mexico, from Albuquerque, and then my family moved to um, the Midwest when I was young. So I grew up in a small town outside of Kansas City. Um, when I was in Missouri, I, uh, you know, just like most kids, you know, we, we love movies, you know, so we're <laughs> watching Star Wars and Indiana Jones and all that stuff, you know. And then um, I was fortunate in high school, we had a professor who let us study film, and I picked uh, a filmmaker, uh, Stanley Kubrick, mm -hmm. who is still, you know, one of my, one of my favorites. Um, but I was also, I also love math and science, and so I kind of set that aside, went to school uh, as a chemical engineer, graduated and worked for, a, worked for a large mining company in Missouri, a big limestone mine. And uh, while I was working, I started to take some night classes at a college, Washington University in St. Louis. And then I got to know the faculty and got into grad school. I was kind of going in as an actor at that time, not on the film side. And they have a program that's, that's more dramatic literature based and with an emphasis in directing. And so that's the path that I pursued as a grad student. Received my MA and then, but the thing is with theater is that I loved, uh, my favorite type of theater was where you were really close, you know, a really small black box theater. And I loved the intimacy that you could have with an audience in that type of environment. Um, and I thought, you know, I wanted to be like a fly in Willie Loman's living room, you know, and just <laughs> be able to like observe. And yeah, I knew, you know, in theater that's hard to do, but with, with, with film you can, you know, with film you can put the camera in there and you can, you can close ups and you can get that kind of intimacy. And that's what I want to achieve, but I knew nothing about making a movie, zero. I, I, I produced uh, actually a student feature. Um, I had no idea what an F-stop was, so I went to film school. You know, and so they definitely, they definitely got me up to speed. Mm -hmm. And so I received an MFA uh, in Chicago at Columbia College. Oh, great. And, you know, ever since then, you know, we're just, uh, just trying to make movies, you know, writing, uh, directing, producing, you know, a little AD work here and there. It's really interesting you start out with a chemical engineering degree. Yeah, yeah. And does that apply to making films at all, do you think? You know, you know it's, it's been really, really helpful, as a matter of fact, because um, the problem solving skills that you learn as an engineer, you know, you identify what the problem is, where you need to get to, and then try to, you know, discover that path. I mean, that problem solving takes place, you know, on a storytelling level, and then also on a logistical level in terms of, you know, just making a movie in that complexity. Um, so I have no regrets at all, yeah. you know. And you know, the thing is, is that, you know, too many filmmakers, too many filmmakers, you know, it's film, film, film all the time, and they don't, you know, they don't get to go out and live a little bit of a life right. and go, you know, experience what it's like to work in a mine and meet these people and, you know, they show up in your work. I mean, I think they enrich in, you know, your experience. Yeah, it's a great background. You mentioned Stanley Kubrick. Were there other filmmakers that Oh, yeah, inspired? yeah, definitely, definitely. You know, um, I'm a huge fan of John Cassavetes, um, you know, A Woman of the Influence. Yeah. It actually directly influ influenced a film in Open Door that we'll catch a clip from later. Okay. Um, Igmar Bergman. I'm a huge <laughs> Igmar Bergman fan. <laughs> Um, you know who? You know who else? I mean, the list goes on. Lars von Trier, I'm a big fan of in terms of contemporary filmmakers. Um, and the list can go on and yeah. on and on. And you know, even you know, the thing is, is that I think you even learn something from the terrible movies. You know, you, go, you know, like sometimes it's good to like, and then and then you go back and you think to yourself, why was that movie terrible? You know, and then how could it have been fixed? And yeah. do kind of you know. Well, these are great filmmakers. They're all they're interesting choices, very different from the previous filmmaker that we interviewed. Um, it seems like the clips that we're seeing today that, that I've seen, you know, there's a style to your film. They're right. kind of internal. They're kind of quiet. A lot of family drama going on. Right. Is that the type of filmmaker you see yourself? Is that I, just these clips? How no, would you it's describe true. your filmmaking? Uh, just kind of, if you had to narrow it down, I know that's hard to do. How would you describe it in general terms? That's a good question. And I should mention another filmmaker that is definitely puts in that whole category, Roman Polanski. Mm -hmm. um, is a huge oh. influence of mine. Um, Rosemary's Baby... Um, yes, it's a kind of a ridiculous film, you know, with the, no. with, but, but if you watch how he tells the relationship through camera movement, through composition, through lighting, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a masterclass, really. And I, in terms of describing my films, or at least the filmmaker that I want to be, um, I would definitely say psychological drama. Okay, before we see the first clip of yours, can you tell us a little bit about the process of putting it together and filming it? I understand the name of it is An Open Door. Right, right, right. For me, for, for me personally, 
the my favorite part of making a movie is is pre-production. You know, that's when the when the like the movie gets made, and then when we get on set, I mean, you're so constrained with time, with money, etc. Everything has to go click, click, click. And if I feel if I've if I've John, done my job correctly as a director, I just make little tweaks like here and there. But it, the machine kind of runs on its own, and it kind of has to because if I'm making major changes, you know, we're we're going to have to. There's going to be something compromised creatively. Um, so you know, like with a film like An Open Door. Um, the way I like to work, and it's a little bit unusual, and it comes, I guess, from my dramatic background, but I take, I take a long time to cast. Like, you know, I will take anywhere from a month to three months to cast a short film, you know, and, and I read everybody possible. And then um, the way I actually run the casting sessions is even when they come in for their very first, you know, audition, they, I give them the scripts, and I always try to audition um, pairs, particularly mm -hmm. like husband and wife, like mm -hmm. you're gonna see in an open door. So I, so I audition just random um, men and women, because you never know when serendipity is gonna hit and you're yeah. gonna get like a spark. And so I would audition them together, and the first time I have them run through it, I have them run through it with script in hand, and then I, I take the scripts away from them. Like entirely, and this is like cold, this is colder than cold, and the actors absolutely cannot stand it. But what I'm doing is I'm, I'm actually trying to watch them listen, and I'm trying to watch them react to one another with, you know, without a safety net. And if, if, I, see, if I see that they're using their imagination, and if I see that they're, um, because the camera can catch people thinking, so if I, if I see them thinking, then, then that's, that's what I'm looking for, that's what I'm looking for. And, but, I mean, I'll read everybody, I'll read anybody. Again, you never know when you're gonna find a diamond in the rough. Um, we go through a, re a rehearsal process, and then I don't do storyboards until the very end, right before we go into production, I bring my, um, bring my cinematographer in, and he photographs the rehearsals. Mm. And that's what we use as our storyboards for the film. Wow. And, uh, and actually, we, the way I, I typically work with the cinematographer is, um, I will, just when him and I meet, I will actually act the film out, or at least act right. the scenes out for him. And then we will have, um, we'll go home, and then we'll have, we'll make our own shot list. And then we'll meet, and then we'll kind of argue and negotiate to see who has the better plan. And sometimes we do it his way, sometimes we do it my way, so, or her way, it's, or sometimes we do a combination of the two, you know. Um, so it's, but it's a, it's a long process. It's an evolved process. And it's an unusual process. And unfortunately, if you look at bigger, you know, million dollar films, um, they can't afford to, to have that kind of rehearsal uh, because I mean, when you're paying the actors for the same amount for the rehearsal that you are for the production, it just makes it economically unfeasible. Sure. So I'm, I'm very fortunate that I've, I've had that opportunity. At the same time, I'm probably you know, totally you know, screwing myself up <laughs> down there in the future when yeah. that's not available. When yeah. those, you know, when, that, <laughs> when, that, when that's, uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, you know, film schools that are teaching people or, you know, these filmmakers are learning how to direct actors with like a week of rehearsal are probably better off, it, but I don't know, personally, I think that in order to kind of achieve that chemistry, at least a very organic way, it just doesn't happen overnight, most of the time. Yeah, I think that shows in your films, all the forethought and planning and the careful choice of actors. But before we talk about it anymore, let's go ahead and look at one of the clips, okay? Here's An Open Door by Sean J.S. Jordan. Her. Sue. Can you get that, honey? Hello? 
One second. Okay. It's for you. Hey, Julie. I'll be right down. Okay. William? Mm-hmm. Who's Julie? She's a co-worker. Can you get my jacket, honey? Hey, are you forgetting something? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Not even a kiss? I'm gonna lay down. Bye, Michelle. Time for school, Nathan! Hey, William. Michelle. Julie, this is my wife, Michelle. I'm pleased to finally meet you. I brought you lunch. I uh, wanted to surprise you. What'd you bring? Fruit. <laughs> a couple of sandwiches. And some chips. Your husband, William, has been a tremendous help to me. I'm sorry, I'm not sure what you do. Or are you a new secretary? Michelle Julie's a new hire. She's an account executive. So was I. That's what I hear. I think I'm handling a few of your old clients. Is that right? Just until you decide to come back. Which ones? Your husband told me. My husband told you what? Michelle, Julie is a friend. Really? I think I'm going to get back to work. Michelle, it was a pleasure to finally meet you. William, we'll touch base later.
I'm sorry we can't show the audience the whole film because it's really outstanding. They've just got the first bit of it it's so good. But, but it's this beautiful film, and you've done a great job with it. And I think it, the actors that you were talking about earlier, especially, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, you know, all the actors, I think, do a phenomenal job. I'm really, really proud of the, the, what they brought to it. And, uh, and Suzanne Langfordor, who the, plays the lead um, in that film, she, I, there's this, I'll never forget, we were rehearsing, and we were rehearsing a scene towards the middle of the film, and it's a dinner scene. And... Um, <laughs> She's talking, she's trying to get her husband to remember what it was like, you know, on their honeymoon and, and the good times they used to have when they took a vacation. And um, she like, she, it's, a, it's, this, it's, it's so beautiful and so touching where she, she like, she like cries and laughs. It's like so painful for her. And, and she did that in rehearsal. And the moment she did that, I was said, no more. Like we have, <laughs> we have this scene where exactly where we want it. We are not going to touch this, this scene until we put it on, on film, you know. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of like that. You know, you just kind of got a lot of different burners in the rehearsal process. And then, yeah. you know, this one's done. Let's set that one aside. You know, and another thing about that clip that really stands out to me is that I think that opening montage um, with the ball in the pool really oh, yeah. just, I mean, the more I watched your clips, the more I saw that that is just really indicative of, of your style, at least in these pieces. Can you say a little bit more about how that worked and how you felt about that moment? Do you think that's you? Sure. No, I, I thank you. I, I, I do. I do like the um, the beginning and that, that montage where we're showing bits and pieces, and we're essentially giving at that point the audience clues to kind of a. I'm not going to ruin the movie, but it's a <laughs> reveal at the end. But we're giving kind of clues to what this family's history is. You know, like I was um, I was mentioning, it's kind of a happy accident because when we shot that, we shot a lot more footage and a lot of different things. The pool was was pretty gross. And you know we couldn't put the, the child into it, and so we had to kind of shoot around that. And it was a happy accident because it allowed us to do that kind of like artful montage, and the water was very, very re nice reflection yeah, off that. It's um, it allowed us to do some nice things, and uh, and it left more to the imagination, yeah. which which I really like. You yeah, know? that does work great. This the ball going into the water is is, yeah. is a wonderful image. Yeah. Now, did this one, this film in particular, get any prizes? Have there any special screenings? Well, I think it's played in between, I don't know, 30 or 40 film festivals. Wow. It's brought, like, a, the Cine Award of Excellence was probably the biggest award, and that came with, um, you know, a film like, a, you know, like, I want a bunch of film from Kodak, I want a cash prize, I want production insurance, I want, it's, 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 um, uh, yeah, it's done well. What about the beekeeper? Has that been yeah, that's actually, won awards? Yeah, that's, that's actually done really well. The beekeeper actually just locally it won the best short at the Castle Rock Film Festival, oh. and it's uh, it's it's played a number of film festivals. It won uh, best screenplay um, at uh, at Vision Fest, and uh, yeah, it's done. It's done. Op opened at I think. I think it actually premiered at the Ohio Film Festival, which was a really nice film Perfect. festival. Okay, well then maybe before we see a scene from The Beekeeper, why don't you talk about the difference maybe, similarities, differences between the two. Um, I think you were mentioning that one was shot on video and one was shot in. Yes, yes, so we shot, um, we shot an open door on video and then we shot The Beekeeper on Super 16. So it was, um, from a cost standpoint, it was a more expensive film to make, just on the film stock alone. Um, but also, it was, it's funny because looking back, an open door is almost a series of vignettes that take place yeah. at different locations. And The Beekeeper really just takes place at one location. Uh -huh. But The Beekeeper is the more complex film because the way we shot the different rooms and all the camera movement and the dolly movement and you know crossing the 180 for all you film people out there and then reestablishing <laughs> the 180, you know, all this, all this stuff, it was really, really, um, really, you know, I guess a challenge to do. Um, and you took it on that way, or it just kind of helped? Yeah, I did. I, I purposely took it on that way, because I think, you know, with every project, I mean, you have to grow a little mm -hmm. bit, you know, both creatively and technically, and you I think you should kind of push the envelope. Sure, you know? sure. What about, what about the actors in, in Beekeeper? Because, again, I see some really strong performances and really a focus on, you know, their faces and their emotional projection. Yeah, and that's more of an ensemble piece, you know, because in in, 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 rather than with an open door, we had lo kind of like changing locations. With the beekeeper, we have kind of a changing of characters, mm -hmm. you know, as they kind of as they kind of rotate through. Um, and again, you know, I'm, I'm really, really happy with the, with the performances, a long rehearsal process, a long casting process. But you know what, like, you know, good things don't come easy, you know, and that location too. I mean, we drove all over the state looking for farmhouses until we found a farmhouse we want. And you wouldn't think, you know, there's a million of them, but you, it's, it's, you know, and you have to be, I think, I think we all want to make movies that can compete on a national and international stage. Yeah. And you have to, um, 
you have to fight. You know, you have to fight for those details, for yeah. like those little things. Um, because there's there's a lot of filmmakers out there, and there's there's a lot of very talented people kind of coming up at all times. And so, um, how do you separate yourself? I mm. mean, is it the story? Is it the craft? Hopefully, if it's a combination of the <laughs> yeah. two. You know, hopefully sure. they work work sure. in parallel. Well, then, before we go to the clip, is there any final uh, thing you wanted the audience to maybe look for in the film, or any fi final thing you want to say about the beekeeper? You know, I just think you know, I you know, I can talk very technically about about the movie, and we did this and this shot and this and this shot, um, but you know, just enjoy it. You know, that's what it's. <laughs> that's, right. like, that's great. We'll save the rest for the for the commentary or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Here, here then is the first few minutes of The Beekeeper by Sean J.S. Jordan. Phil, could you give me a hand with some boxes? Is anybody here? Come on in, dear. Where's your mom? Outside. Here. Thank you. You're welcome. Can I cuddle? Of course you can, dear. Hey. I got something for you. It's not much to look at, but I put a deposit on it this morning. Do you two need any help out there? Hey, we've got it. No, these boxes are for you. I thought you were going to take care of that. And I am. I'm glad you got the house. Yeah.
It'll come in handy afterwards. Wait, what's the matter? Come on. They're expecting us. Where are the boxes? In the car. I didn't think you'd need them. Oh. How are you doing, Robin? Fine. I bet you're gonna miss William as much as I am. <laughs> He's upstairs, if you want to say a quick goodbye. Mind keeping an eye on Martha for me? No, not at all. really not leaving anything behind, are you? Doesn't seem that way, does it? It'll be nice, though. Going back to school. When I'm not studying. Yeah. the grocery store. So, um, how about a goodbye kiss before you go? Yeah. Yeah, again, I wish they could see the whole film because they're just getting the beginning of it and it just is a beautiful piece. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about establishing characters, setting things up, how, how you do that in a short film and especially just in the first few minutes? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, with a short film, you don't have much time. I mean, you kind of have to cut to the chase. And so you kind of, you just jump right in and you, you know, but here we're dealing in a very powerful medium, and that's the, that's the medium of pictures. So you can, you can show a lot. And that's, you know, show, don't tell, show, don't tell. So, um, with, without relying on dialogue and without which which drama does you know that's kind of its strength um, 
But we have something where we can show people in their environments doing certain things and, and possibly show their relationship to not only each other but their, their environment itself. Um, so, you know, with, an open, well, with the beekeeper, um, you know, we have these tableaus, you know, so we have, you know, um, what would be called just kind of, you know, things are kind of in an equilibrium. They're not really, but they're kind of in an equilibrium. And we can kind of see kind of what's, how this day is beginning for these characters. Yeah. You know, and, and, and for me, it's almost like, you know, you, if you're going to show two trains colliding, you show one leaving the station here, one leaving the station here. And, and a lot then, in between. <laughs> yeah, and a lot in between, you know. Um, so, you know, I, I always, I think it's kind of neat. And that's the power of film. And, you know, at least for me, I always, like when I'm working on a script, I always try to go through it and try to cut out as much dialogue as possible and then see what, how can I show. And this is actually true, um, something I found very helpful in documentary work is when I'm interviewing a subject, you know, I'll, I'll interview people just how we're interviewing each other. But I also find that's really revealing if you can get them to do a task, you know, while you interview them because you're, you're unguarded, you know, you... Um, Oftentimes your movement gives yeah. a subtext that you don't normally get through just talking. Yeah. And it's more interesting, yeah. you know? And so that's why even on set, you know, you, when you're directing, you have to give your actor something to do, you know? And I just have to ask the bee, the bees and yeah. the beekeeper theme, you know? I, I'm probably just not, not quite getting it, but does it have an exact, you know, application? Or how did it's, you choose that? Why is that part of, part of it? Well, just from a very, very basic level, I love bees. I think, I think they're like <laughs> fascinating insects. And, and kind of the cool thing about working in this business is you can pick a subject matter that you're interested in and research it. And so I would keep bees if I had any land. And I've had the chance to meet beekeepers. I've had a chance to drink lots of mead with beekeepers. Oh, that's the <laughs> yes. reason it's so, the mead. So, that they're, so I really, I think they're, they're fascinating people and fascinating, um, it's fascinating. It's not just a hobby, you know. Um, but I saw, you know, I had this, I was thinking about these, these bees, and I was even thinking about making a documentary about beekeepers. And then I also separately had this idea about a family and kind of this, kind of this intrigue that's taking place. Then I thought, well, you know what, maybe if I can marry them, it'll be a nice metaphor. Like the bees will be a nice metaphor. Um, and, you know, talking about filmmakers, I like Igmar Bergman, you know, his yeah. use of metaphor, uh, Polanski, you know, Coop. I mean, these, these artists always, um, in, and, you know, speaking of, um, we're filming this in a library. You know, you, my favorite authors, you know, use metaphor in their work. I mean, you know, in, in my in my humble opinion, and you may want to, you know, in my, some advice advice to some to up and coming filmmakers is read a little bit. You know, I think Ernest Hemingway. You know, if you want to be a screenwriter, read Ernest Hemingway because the way he structures senses and and um, and you get a sense even just by reading how he worked. You know, where he would say, "Let them all think you're a genius." But the truth is you had to struggle all day long on that paragraph to make it perfect. And that's, that's the kind of craftsmanship that we're talking about, not just on you know, making the film, but also in building the screenplay. And you know, personally, I just like, I think families are really interesting, particularly when they deal with moral ambiguity. Um, you know, this is something that I think is, we can all relate to. You know? We all have families, we all deal with moral ambiguity on a day-to-day -day basis, almost. And um, that's where drama lies. In, in those tough decisions that we have to make and live with, and live with their consequences. If you can make a small story complex, I think that is, um, that's tough, and I, I love it, I love yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, like taking a diamond in the rough and making it really sparkle. Yeah, but you know, it's not, it's not an easy path, and you know, I wanna caution, you know, if any filmmakers out there who, who are thinking about moving in this direction, you know, I'll, I'll, it's a bit of a cautionary tale too, because um, people, you know, the, the family psychological drama genre is not the most lucrative genre. You know, it doesn't fill multiplexes like, like Batman does or The Born Identity, you know. Um, and so, you know, if, you know, just kind of step back a little bit and The Beekeeper is part of a larger project. Actually, there's a feature that's behind it um, and uh, the script was a finalist for the Sundance Lab. So I've had the opportunity to be in Los Angeles pitching and talk to people about it, and I've learned don't say family drama because <laughs> because if you want to see some eyes roll, pretty soon, like that's yeah. you'll get it. So you have to kind of learn to kind of couch it in different terms. You know, psychological drama is maybe a better way to, uh -huh. to go about it, um, and you know they're a little hesitant to take it take a risk on something like yeah. that. Um, but you know what? I love them, and somebody's got to make them. Yeah. And you know, <laughs> it's might like, as well be you since so you're this is my cross to bear. You know, but but having said that, um, my next project I just finished a script called Teddy Boy. That's a psychological drama that definitely has thriller elements in it. And I've learned um, through the the beekeeper battles um, that maybe something with a little more thriller elements to it will make it more marketable. And and actually. Um, 
there has been a, some interest in it, even at this very early stage. Uh, so I'm kind of excited about that. And that's something that I definitely wrote uh, with, you know, Colorado and the mountains and stuff in mind. And so, um, yeah, we'll see. Great, great. Uh, now, before we get too far away from these two films, I yeah. just want to say, is there, a is there a chance for the viewers to see the films in their entirety? Somehow? Yes, yes. Okay, so we've been very fortunate with both films. Um, we signed a distribu distribution agreement with one of the largest short film distributors in the world called Shorts International. And, uh, and any short filmmakers out there should definitely look them up. Um, they have a, uh, a cable agreement with AT&T. So the, films, the, the Beekeeper's been on AT&T stateside and then also shown on cable um, to uh, international audience. Um, they have the rights for both films. They haven't done anything with an open door yet, but the Beekeeper, they just put it on iTunes. So um, the viewers can, can check it out there. You know, just type in the Beekeeper and my name and it'll pop up. Oh, okay, so. great. And, and open door, will that be on iTunes? Hopefully think? soon, hopefully soon. They, they have it, um, they tell me it's coming out, um, but it's really, unfortunately, out of my control. So um, just, you know, I guess in terms of, you know, any advice I would have to any, you know, filmmakers mm -hmm. who are kind of out there, just don't squander any opportunity. And you know, take you know, take just about every job. I mean, you'll you'll get to a point where you can kind of see, well, maybe I, c I should pass on this one. You'll kind of pay your dues, but you know, there's always opportunity in everything. And um, and if you can if you can you know sow um, gold out of a sow's ear, you know, you're gonna people are gonna want to work with you. And um, you can you know, as difficult as it may get, you know, those there is unfortunately times when you have to go 14, 16 hours a day. I mean, you cannot give up. You have to. You are all in all the time, you know, and um, just remember that people are watching. Yeah, that's great advice, great information. We've been talking with Sean J.S. Jordan. Thanks for joining us. This is Colorado Cinema Spotlight.